Right, I want to bring back Dr. Judy Klein, and she's here to speak her last talk on healing our wounds. Please help me welcome Judy. Wow. This on, testing. I was in Rome at the Regina Apostolorum studying bioethics and I was upstairs in the upstairs of the school and some, one of the friends I was studying with was outside in the parking lot a little bit down the street and I was talking and she was from England. She came in and she said, Judy, if you ever, ever, ever speak to a whole stadium of people, please don't use a mic. <laughs> in other words, again, my voice was very loud and she heard me down the block, but so anyhow, God is good. I, that was amazing. What a beautiful, amazing day of Holy Spirit power. I, um, it, that's kind of a hard story to follow because it's so deep. It made me weep. Very, very beautiful. But I do want to start with, let's just start with another little prayer because we need God's help. In the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful and enkindle in us the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and we shall be created, and thou shall renew the face of the earth. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I, um, I'm not sure where I'm going with this. The Holy Spirit's going to surprise us all. <laughs> so let me start with the scripture. Isaiah 61. You're probably familiar with this beautiful scripture that Jesus confirmed and affirmed was the truth and the reality of who he was. In Luke's gospel, he says, Isaiah says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the afflicted, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, a release to the prisoners to announce a year of favor from the Lord and a day of vindication by our God, to comfort all who mourn, to place on those who mourn in Zion a diadem instead of ashes, to give them oil, <laughs> tears are contagious, oil of gladness in place of mourning. a glorious mantle instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of justice, the planting of the Lord to show his glory. They shall rebuild the ancient ruins, it goes on to say, the former wastes. They shall raise up and restore the desolate cities, devastations of generation upon generation because their shame was twofold and disgrace was proclaimed their portion they will possess twofold in their own land everlasting joy will be theirs amen um so i want to talk about the healing of our wounds and yes i weep when i talk to <laughs> It's easier to give a theological talk than a per personal testimony on some cases, but um, I was raised in New Orleans, the six of 10 children, um, raised in a, a Catholic family who my mom left the Catholic church after having 10 years and 10 kids in 10 years by the age of 31. Um, again, I put you in the time context of when contraception came on the market and she got swept up in feminism and, and our lives changed. She left the church and um, never went back until she was almost in her 80s. But she did come back. Thank you, St. Philomena. <laughs> That's a whole nother story. But um, I went, was Catholic educated my entire life. I went to Catholic grammar school, high school, and college, and graduated college, what you call a soft atheist. I was agnostic, moving toward atheism, not sure if God existed. And I, um, by God's grace, I was basically a pagan. I didn't profess to be a Christian, didn't even really know if God was real. 
And uh, I started to cry out to God. And by the way, I have a book, Miracle Man, that tells my testimony and a book out there called Mary's Way. And I tell my testimony in both different stories, but they're, um, they go into a lot of detail, more, more detail than I can go here. In any case, I, was inv- I started to cry out to God to show me if he was real. And I was invited by my cousin's cousin to come to, who happened to be jogging by my house one day, our apartment in uptown New Orleans. And he invited me to come to church with him. And he had left the Catholic Church. He had come up into my apartment, and I knew he was wild like I was. And I said, Kent, what happened to you? Like, you look totally different. And he said, I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And my life has been completely changed. He said, in fact, would you like to come to church with me on Sunday? And I was like, sure. I mean, okay. So he said, I'll pick you up. And I woke up that morning like, what in God's name did I just do? (laughs) Why did I say I would do that? But in any case, he came and picked me up, and I went to a little evangelical Christian church on Tulane's campus. And the pastor said the sinner's prayer. If you want to know that God's real, if you want to know that he exists, you know, acknowledge that you're a sinner and surrender your life to the Lord. And I prayed that prayer that day, truly with everything in my being, because I was in a pretty dark place after living as a pagan for a number of years, and I didn't hear bells go off, and I didn't hear see lightning strike, but my, I came to know that I 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 know that God is real, and my, I had a St. Paul conversion. My life went from black to light in one split second when I gave my life to the Lord. Having said that, I had lots and lots of wounds from my childhood that were not healed, So I got what we call evangelical Christianity saved, (laughs) but I didn't get healed. Actually, what I say now is my baptism took. I I was baptized on November 20th when I was a month old, three weeks old, at Immaculate Heart of Mary Catholic Church. Go figure. (laughs) And so I came to know the Lord, and I still needed a lot of healing. And, you know, what I have come to learn over the years is that God wants to heal us, and that's a process, and we've talked a lot about that process today. But I was loaded, loaded, loaded with toxic shame. Um, All I ever wanted to do was be a mother. I never really wanted a career. I didn't want to do anything besides get married and have children, which was good. My mother encouraged us to have children and encouraged me to stay home and raise my children, which I'm grateful she did. And I got married. Actually, I got pregnant and got married. And um, my precious first daughter was born on Christmas Eve in 1985, and I just knew that I was going to be a phenomenal mother, and that's all I had ever wanted to do. Well, I got a sweet, precious baby. Well, I didn't have (laughs) the attachment, now that I know what attachment is, to attach properly to her. And my precious child had horrible colic for four straight months, and she did not stop screaming day and night for four months. And I was walking the floor like, again, what, and what is wrong with me? I mean, I just, this was the one thing in life I knew I was going to do well, and I couldn't get this baby to stop. And not only that, all of my rage, anger, unhealed issues, sexual abuse wounds, I mean, just massive amounts of woundedness came flying up to the surface of my emotions. And I really, I was afraid of the level of anger I felt toward that screaming baby. Let's just put it that way. So I started going to counseling. I started going to therapy at that time. So, you know, counseling has been an invaluable tool in my life. It is a tool, one of many, in how we get healed. The 12 steps have been an invaluable tool in my life for healing. That's a miraculous program of recovery that I'm, I am in the 12 steps as well. But I started going to counseling, and the first day I went in, the man looked at me, who was a Protestant pastor, and he looked and he said, were you sexually abused? And I was like, yeah, but I mean, it didn't affect me. And he's like, uh, <laughs> Houston, we got a problem. So anyway, I went through several years of counseling, different counselors, lots of trouble in our marriage. It was a very difficult, difficult situation. My husband, Bernie, had a a massive heart attack in 2008 and had a major conversion on his deathbed after having a near-death experience and going to meet Jesus after 25 years of praying for his conversion, praise God, and died a beautiful, holy, holy death and was buried on the Feast of St. Joseph in 2009 after 87 days in the ICU. That's what Miracle Man is about. It's an incredible story. But what God did was he started to bring my wounds to the surface so they could be healed. 
and difficult marriage. I had four kids in four and a half years, and my life was really unmanageable. And um, I started to go to another therapist, another Protestant therapist, actually. I wasn't back in the Catholic Church yet, who the first day I went in, she ha had me basically do a little exercise, and she said, close your eyes and picture yourself as a little girl. And when we talk about the devastated ruins, my soul was literally a devastated ruin. My heart was a devastated ruin. I saw a, all I can use the word is hideous little creature that looked like E.T. Y'all remember the movie E.T. from Outer Space? He was an alien. Worse than that, in a big tin garbage can, almost inhuman, with a snake wrapped all around its body. And my therapist looked at me and she said, with almost tears in her eyes, she said, how did your little girl get so dirty and so evil? Because that's what I believed about myself. And I not only believed I was dirty, filthy dirty, that I was evil to the core and there was something so wrong with me that if anybody really knew what was inside of me, they would be appalled. God in his great, great mercy after, I was desperate. Y'all, I went to every healing retreat. I went to every, <laughs> everything I could find to try to get well. Spiritual direction, counseling, confession. Eventually, I came back to the Catholic Church through Our Lady's intervention. That's another story. And I finally, one day, an inner healing prayer was a big part of that. And I went to a, a, a priest and this other woman in New Orleans who were doing healing prayer for people. And I had begun journaling in a workbook called Captivating. There's a wonderful book and workbook called Captivating about healing the wounds of our soul and our femininity, again by another Protestant author, but phenomenal piece of work. And I had stopped halfway through the book. I had spent hours and hours and hours in the chapel that summer working through this book. And I stopped halfway through because I had hit a wall of shame, and I knew I couldn't go any further in the book. And I had written God a note, God, I'm so full of shame. Please heal me of shame. Please deliver me and my children of shame. And I put the book down, and I did not look at it for a year. In fact, I didn't even remember writing that. A year after that, I went to this priest and this woman in New Orleans who did healing prayer. And I came in, and this priest was a, a Dominican, and he had the Blessed Sacrament exposed. And he and the woman started praying. I don't even think they said very much over me. And I literally fell on the ground, weeping and weeping and weeping and weeping. And I saw myself suddenly transported into the throne room of the Father. I was in a white light that was so gorgeous. And I could see the Father, and I felt him saying, come to me. And I started running. Oh, by the way, I was in my first communion dress, which being the third daughter, it was a hand-me-down. And my dress had gotten sent to the dry cleaners and turned yellow. This is a true story. So on the day of my first communion, everybody kept saying all day, why is your dress yellow? Well, again, I'm like, you know, everybody can see something's wrong with me, this little girl who was seven. So I can feel the Father saying, come to me. And I see myself in my yellow first communion dress running toward the Father. And all of a sudden, I stopped, and I was so ambivalent to go any further. And I said, I was saying, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And then all of a sudden, it was like, and I felt my head feel like it was going to explode. And I said, God, I have so much shame. I can't come to you. Deliver me of shame. And when I said this, I literally had a deliverance of a spirit of shame because our wounds, trauma heals us. I'm a trauma counselor now. <laughs> trauma wounds us and fractures us. And often demonic entities will attach themselves to these traumatic wounds. And when the wounds are healed, the demons often leave, and sometimes we really have to go through deliverance prayer. I felt my head feel like it was going to explode, and I felt this shame spirit come out of my head, through my body, out of my head. And then I saw myself with God again, and I was in a white First Communion dress. And I could see his beautiful light everywhere around me. And he looked at me, the Father, and he said, look, you are beautiful. You are beautiful. And all of a sudden, I, he grabbed my hands, and we started dancing, 
dancing in a circle, dancing and joyfully laughing. And it was probably the most profound experience I've ever had of the presence of God. A direct experience of God the Father in heaven and of his love for me. And that heals us, the direct experience of the love of God. I laid there for a little while laughing, actually, hysterically. I was on the floor, <laughs> and this priest and this woman stood over me praying, probably for about another 30 minutes, and I laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed and danced with God. And I went to the chapel after that, and I had my workbook in the back, this notebook I had been working on in the back of the car, and I pulled it out. And I opened it up shockingly to what I had written a year before. And it said, the prayer about God healing me of shame and delivering me. And it said, dance. When it said, God, this is what I'd written. God does not want us to change. He wants us to dance. Below that, I had defined dance according to what the Holy Spirit had given me. Dance, trust, intimacy, surrender. Follow, look at, gaze upon, feel, see, breathe upon, closeness, communicate, touch, enamor, enjoy, have fun, play, relax, prepare for more, be in sync with. And below that I had written, the kingdom of God is among us and in us. We find it by becoming like little children, open, awe-filled, spontaneous, expectant, trusting, and full of heart. I didn't even remember writing those words, and I literally was in shock. It was that same day after I danced with the Father, I went and got this workbook out that I had written a year before that and could not remember doing, and that is the words I had written. And then I wrote below that, my core belief about myself is that I am shameful, unlovable. There's something wrong with me. Lord God Almighty, deliver me from the spirit of shame deliver my children as well. Now, that was a mighty work of God in my life that has really led me to the work I'm doing today. And I cannot believe what God has done for me. When we were having adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, I literally was remembering that wounded, devastated, sort of pitiful little girl, so shame-bound and full of self-hatred and self-rejection. And what God has done for me is look me in the eyes and say, look, you are beautiful. You are beautiful. And subsequently, he's clothed me in white. He's brought me to a beautiful garden, which is my inner room. And he's given me Jesus there to live with me as the good shepherd. <laughs> and Jesus is in beautiful white linen. And I am in a white linen gown with little white flowers around my head by a stream in a, in a pasture like a meadow, like the 23rd Psalm. And that's my inner room, and that's where I meet the Lord. And God promises us this. 1 Corinthians, where I have this written somewhere, First, 2 Corinthians 17, 18. It's St. Paul wrote, now this Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. All of us gazing with unveiled face on the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory as from the Lord who is spirit. And so we're healed the same way we're wounded. We're wounded in relationship and we're healed in relationship. And God bless our priests and our spiritual confessors and our spiritual fathers and our spiritual mothers and, the peop and our nuns and the people that have taken us under their wing. Because you don't have to have someone in your immediate family to love you and mother you and nurture you and father you. <laughs> I was, I've been seeing the same spiritual director who's a priest in, in our area for almost 20 years now. And Siri, I was telling Siri something one day, and I said, Siri, call Father Robert. And she said, do you want me to record Father Robert as your father? I said, yes. <laughs> because my father is deceased, and he, had a, he died a beautiful death as well, full of the mercy and love of God. But what I've come to know about where we are is all of the ages that we ever were are in us. <laughs> and God wants to heal every one of those parts of our, our hearts. The evil one's translation of his name, Satan, means the scatterer, right? 
Satan comes through trauma, through neglect, through abuse, and he fractures our hearts, and he scatters them. He disintegrates us. He wants us to be bes literally beside ourselves. And God's promise is that I will gather you in. I will gather you in from all the places to which you have been scattered. And you know what he says in Jeremiah 29? We all know that. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Go on and read the next couple of verses. Because he promises, I will gather you in from all the places to which you have been scattered, and I will change your lot. When we come to know the Lord Jesus and his Holy Spirit and his Father, we don't stay the same. We are a miracle in progress. Our lives are a miracle in progress. And part of that miracle is happening today. I want to invite you to do something a little daring. And um, I, I, as I said, I'm a trauma counselor now. I, I got my PhD eventually in, in clinical pastoral counseling. And we do a lot of inner child work with people. And, you know, it all comes down to, in my mind, like Jesus said, become like little children. Get back to the place where your heart was innocent and where you trusted and before you were fractured and fragmented. The Lord integrates us back into the whole in and through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we do these little inner child meditations in, in my practice. Okay, how much time do we have? Okay, so we're going to just, I'm going to invite you. Okay, so here's the thing. This is completely voluntary. It's not going to be scary. But if you, you're welcome not to participate, because I don't want to force this on anybody. If you feel that, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, and we're going to do a little inner child meditation. If you feel at any point you want to open your eyes or get up and leave the room, please, you are welcome to do that. Okay? God is gentle. He's tender. He doesn't want to scare us, and he certainly doesn't want to re-traumatize us. So I just, we're going we're gonna to say a little prayer, and then I want to invite you to do a little experi experi experiential exercise to end this day. And then we'll have some more prayer, I think, after that. So let's just, everybody close your eyes. We don't need to be looking around. Just take a, a deep breath and relax. <coughs> Excuse me, let me get a sip of water. Feel your feet on the ground and just feel your feet on the ground. Feel your body touching the chair and just ground yourself physically in the space where you are and we just take a deep breath in for five seconds and we're going to invite the holy spirit one two three four five and just breathe out seven seconds one two three four five six seven breathe in the holy spirit one two three four five and breathe out any fear or anything that may be heavy or oppressing you. One, two, three, four, five. And what I want you to do right now is just picture yourself as a little girl. Any age that comes to mind, just see if you can get an image of yourself as a little girl. And I want you to see if you can locate where she is. Is she in a house? Is she outside? What color is her hair? What is she wearing? Is she in a room? Is there anything that she can smell? Colors that she can see? And wherever she is, I want you to see yourself as an adult right now. And I want you to come as you are today, and I want you to go to the place where she is. And if it's in a house, go through the front door and go through the rooms of the house and enter the space where she is. Or if it's outside, go meet her there and just see yourself walking up to her and see yourself standing before her. And what I'd like you to do is take her little chin and put your finger under it and lift her chin to your face and look her in the eyes. Look her in the eyes and see what you see in her eyes. What do you think she's feeling? 
Is she at peace? Is she happy? Is she content? Is she confident? Is she afraid? Is she anxious? Is she sad? And I just, in, the, in, your, in your mind's eye, I want you to look her in the eye. And it's okay if you can't see this. And sometimes people can't. But I want you to just say to her what she most needed to hear at that moment in her life where you're seeing her. What did she need to hear? Or what do you want to convey and impart to her? Does she need encouragement? Does she need to know everything's going to be okay? Or maybe she needs to hear, I love you. You are precious to me. Just dialogue with her for a moment and let your words speak to her and your heart speak to her. Knowing what you know now, knowing who you are, speak to her heart. And then I want you to notice, is there anything she needs to say to you or wants to know of you? See that precious little girl? God's beloved daughter. And speak to her heart and let her heart speak to yours. And now I want you to notice if Jesus is in the room or in the space with that little girl and your adult. Or maybe Our Lady is there. Perhaps Our Lady has been a mother in your life. And I would just like you to let Jesus and or Our Lady approach. And let them place their hands, one on your little girl, on her shoulder, one on your adult. And hear the words of Jesus as he speaks in the name of the Father. And speaks a benediction over you. You are precious in my sight and beautiful. You are beloved my chosen one. I give you my benediction. And I give you the Father's benediction. And I ask that his blessing would come and rest upon you. And tenderly touch what has come up today. To heal the wounds of the heart. To bless also the gifts you have received to release you in a deeper anointing of the Holy Spirit and in all of the gifts and the blessings of the Lord. And I'm going to close with a psalm. Just keep your eyes closed. And I want you to receive this into your being as a prayer. This is Psalm 139 from the Passion Translation. Lord, you know everything there is to know about me. You perceive every movement of my heart and soul. And you understand my every thought before it even enters my mind. You are so intimately aware of me, Lord. You read my heart like an open book and you know all of the words I'm about to speak. Before I even start a sentence... You know every step I will take before my journey even begins. You've gone into my future to prepare the way, and in kindness you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. You have laid your hand on me. This is just too wonderful, deep, and incomprehensible. Your understanding of me brings me wonder 
and strength. Where could I go from your spirit? Where could I run and hide from your face? If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the realm of the dead, you're there too. If I fly with the, the wings into the shining dawn, you are there. If I fly into the radiant sunset, you're there waiting. Wherever I go, your hand will guide me. Your strength will empower me. It is impossible to disappear from you or to ask the darkness to hide me. For your presence is everywhere bringing me into the light. There is no such thing as darkness with you. The night to you is as bright as the, as bright as the day. There is no difference between the two. You formed my inmost being, shaping my delicate inside and my intricate outside, and wove them all together in my mother's womb. I thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. Everything you do is marvelously breathtaking. It simply means, it simply amazes me to think about it. How thoroughly you know me, Lord. You even formed every bone in my body when you created me in the secret place. Carefully, skillfully, you have shaped me from nothing into something. You saw who you created me to be before I became me. Before I'd ever seen the light of day, the number of the days you planned for me were already recorded in your book. Every single moment you were thinking of me, how precious and wonderful to consider that you cherish me constantly in your every thought. Oh God, your desires toward me are more than the grains of sand on every shore. When I awake each morning, you're still with me. God, I invite your searching gaze into my heart. Examine me through and through. Find out everything that may be hidden within me. Put me to the test and sift through all of my anxious cares. See if there is any path of pain I'm walking on and lead me back to your glorious everlasting way, the path that brings me back to you. Father in heaven, I thank you for your precious daughters who are assembled here today. In the name of your son, Jesus, I ask you to seal any healing that has happened today in the blood of Jesus. I ask you to let the healing continue to flow through these next days. I ask you for reconciliation within their own hearts of any fragmented parts, any fractured or rejected parts. Father, gather them together from all the places to which they have been scattered. And let them know that only goodness and kindness will follow them all of the days of their life. In Jesus' name we pray. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So just let the healing continue to flow. And if you have time in the next few days, maybe spend some time before Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. And let him continue to heal your beautiful heart. In Jesus' name.